Good morning. How are you guys? Great. How many of you have been doing the Lily Day of Service uh, since its inception? Holy cow. Um, so I, I'm, I'm just going to spend a few minutes with you, but uh, I'm really interested in providing a couple introductions uh, and to give you a sense of the, the true impact and meaning of the work. You can believe me, but you also might like to hear a little bit of research and some data that supports the amazing work you've been doing for the past seven years. Um, and so we're going to do that. But um, take a moment. I'm not going to invite you to close your eyes because uh, it's a little too early in the morning. But just take a moment and think about your experiences over the past, maybe if it was even last year when you began, uh, or even as many as seven. Think about the images maybe that uh, uh, get conjured up when you think about the day of service. I'm going to tell you a few that come to mind for me, OK? Uh, and then we'll, we'll drive down into some of the impact that you guys are having. Color, vibrancy, beauty, creativity, the song of goldfinches as they light on the wonderful new invasive removal and restoration along Fall Creek. Cherries that are now being picked on the trees by culinary students at Ivy Tech uh, that now have that opportunity to use the land for education uh, and uh, improvement in their own lives. Murals that bring life and delight and pride and a sense of place uh, to those that were once just colorless geographies. Maybe it's the tent in the Monon that you think about and worked on. Maybe it was out in Lafayette Square with Big Car. Maybe it was that small business that's sticking it out um, in the neighborhood of the Children's Museum and now proudly has that gorgeous underwater mural that you all helped with. Maybe it's the drive along Madison Avenue, that one that was not so great a few years back that now features world record breaking art conceived by students on the south side of Indianapolis and implemented by you. Maybe it's the 12,000 trees that you've planted since we began our work together and all of the carbon and all of the dirty water uh, that uh, these trees are providing for this community in terms of removing those things. Maybe it's the power of Lilly that has moved city government and state government to act to create trails or to invest in infrastructure because you guys said yes. So, you know, what is that impact of the day of service with Cape Indianapolis Beautiful? Your work falls nothing short of enabling the dreams of people in our community become, to become real, to create beautiful and more inspired living environments for everybody in this city. Um, you can take my word for it, as I said, uh, or you can believe the research and some of the data. So, I know. How many of you have planted trees and hauled invasive honeysuckle like more than once? Uh-huh, right? Uh, the big mountain of mulch, you're like, my, I just can't believe we're doing this again this year. Let me, right? Let me tell you a little bit about this and then you're gonna hear about why this is so important. We've worked with Butler Center for Urban Ecology uh, over the past few years to understand the impact that you're having in this community. Now, Interstate 70, Many of you worked on that years ago. Uh, and we are understanding now, after five years, the natives that are working, the natives that haven't worked, uh, and watch for more investment uh, in the coming months on Interstate 70, because we want to invest in the things that are thriving. Take uh, the Sam Jones interchange. How many of you maybe remember working on the Sam Jones interchange? Let me tell you about the impact that you're having there. Working with Butler Center for Urban Ecology, we now understand that compared to a control site uh, where it's just simply turf and weeds, that the work you've done has increased at least twice the amount of biodiversity uh, in that interchange. And you're going to know why, even more why that's important here in just a few minutes. You know, there's prairie drop seed and there's sumac and red bud and very select tr trees now in this interstate land that is truly helping the environment. How many of you have worked along Fall Creek? Let me tell you a little bit about Fall Creek, where you have eliminated 30 acres of invasive honeysuckle 
and restored it with about 50,000 native plants and grasses and an orchard. Uh, now what we are seeing, again through our work with Butler Center for Urban Ecology, is a standard called the Habitat Quality Index that is moving clearly in the right direction. I took a little walk there over the weekend and it was an amazing thing. So one more bit, just up the street, the Oaks Academy. Your work there a number of years ago is enabling children to have creative play. So maybe the school says, yeah, we'll let them have a couple of bumps and bruises uh, and they'll have an opportunity to run and jump and play on these outcroppings and to watch a family of ducks being fledged and to do some creative writing about that instead of working on asphalt and uh, playing on purple and yellow plastic, right? It's an amazing impact that you all are having. So life is busy. I understand that. It's easy for me when I finish a project to sort of move on to the next thing, but what I want to do is ask you to do me a favor. If you have the chance, get on your bicycle and bike Fall Creek Trail from Central up to 56th Street, and you'll see the impact that you're having. If you drive north from Carmel or from the north side of Indianapolis to Lilly every day, take Meridian Street, take a little detour on Fall Creek Parkway, make a right, go past Ivy Tech, go past Barton Park, and you'll see all the way down to 21st Street, the impact, the color, the beauty, the liveliness of the work right there in front of you. Or take a walk in the Lily Sustainability Park and you'll be amazed along with the goldfinch and the bees and the butterflies about the amazing work that you all are doing. So I want you to be assured and you'll learn more that this day of service is really important to helping our people and our nature thrive in our city. Thank you so much for what you do. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker. You're going to be hearing from two internationally renowned um, researchers who study plants and spaces and the impact that it has really on the thriving of life in our country and in our world. The natural world and, of course, people were a part of that, but sometimes we forget it. The first introduction that I want to give, uh, if you're a gardening person, if you want to uh, be inspired uh, by a book, uh, Doug Tallamy has written something called Bringing Nature Home. I encourage you to read it. He has another book coming out called Living Landscapes. But uh, he's sort of like, um, he's like a prophet uh, for people like us. Uh, and uh, he is a professor in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware. He's authored 80 research articles. Uh, he's taught insect taxonomy, behavioral ecology, humans and nature, and more. Um, his book, Bringing Nature Home, uh, was published in 2007, uh, and he's won numerous awards, but um, you know, there's a little quiver in my heart and other people's hearts when you mentioned Doug Tallamy. I, they spoke to a full house here last night, uh, and I would say that Doug Tallamy and the work of our next speaker uh, have given me epiphanies about the importance of seeing the work of the Lily Day of Service in a new and a clear way, and I hope they do that for you too. So it's my pleasure to introduce Doug Tallamy. Well, thank you, Dave. I'm not a prophet, but <laughs> let's see if we can find, there we go. Okay, Dave says I have uh, 20 minutes to co further convince you that what you're doing and what you've been doing for seven years uh, is really important. So let's talk about box turtles. This is the eastern box turtle. Most people know it uh, by encountering it in an old field. Uh, so they think, well, these are denizens of old fields. But in fact, they actually live in forest almost all of their life. And when they're in patches of woods, they spend most of the day buried underneath vegetation. But in the springtime, they go according. Uh, and these guys really were courting, by the way. I just scared them when I snuck up on them uh, with, the, with the camera. If that's successful, the female will then leave the woodlot 
to lay her eggs. She's got to find a sunny patch so that the sun will incubate the eggs. So she digs a hole, she lays her eggs, uh, and of course those eggs hatch. But um, they hatch underground. And we don't know much about these, these uh, tiny first year box turtles because they spend up to that first full year underground. So nobody ever encounters them. The reason I, I ran into this guy is I was digging a hole to plant a tree. Uh, and there it was. And the next time you actually see them uh, is back in the woodlot or the old field when they're um, well on their way to maturity. Box turtles can live 80 years. It usually takes them about 20 years to reach sexual maturity. So they have a life history very similar to, to humans. So if, if you squish a box turtle on the road, think of Uncle Joe. I mean, you've just, you've just <laughs> killed Uncle Joe. Okay, this, this little patch of woods is what we call the, the uh, University of Delaware woodlot or ecology woods. It's a 35 acre woodlot uh, that has been isolated on this campus for well over 100 years. In 1968, Paul Katz, a guy by the name of Paul Katz, decided he wanted to study the box turtles in that woodlot. So he caught all of the ones that he could find and marked them individually so he could continue to, to catch them and find them after that. And he found 91 turtles in 1968. Now, if we look down the woodlot from, uh, from the sky, we see that it truly is isolated. It's isolated by, uh, on two sides by agricultural fields, one side by athletic fields, and the south side is uh, bordered by a four-lane highway. Um, off to the upper left, right, whatever it is, up there is another patch of woods, Webb Farm, and down in the, the uh, lower corner, you have another patch of woods. And all of those have box turtles, but you can see that they are isolated from each other. This is what we call habitat fragmentation. The habitats are physically separated, and there's no way box turtles can move back and forth between those habitats, because as soon as they leave the woodlot, they're in uh, grave danger of being mowed or plowed. Uh, but this is the real danger for, for uh, box turtles. And I do have a picture of a squished box turtle, but I've learned I shouldn't show it. But this is why in 19, 1968, there were 91 box turtles come back. Um, in 2000 and 2002, I think, there were 22 box turtles. And in 2010, there were just 12 box turtles left in the woodlot. So you can see what is happening here. Um, this population is on a steady trajectory towards local extinction. That habitat is realizing what we call its extinction debt. And that's because the number of box turtles being killed exceeds the number of box turtles entering the population. There are very few box turtles entering the population. So when we isolate a habitat uh, from, from its, its uh, greater sources, and then we go in and we measure the animals that are there, if we do that one or two years after the isolation, we find them there. And we say, okay, everything's fine. But uh, the remaining individuals are actually declining, and it may take decades before they actually disappear, that extinction debt. So that's one of the problems from fragmentation. Things are advancing without my knowledge here. Um, it's not just, just uh, box turtles that are in trouble. It's the amphibians. It's the reptiles, all the things that crawl out and get squished. Even large insects. This is a large carabid beetle. It's a flightless species, and many of those species are. Um, we have studied these in the woodlot. They are, they are gone, 100% gone from the woodlot compared to a larger habitat just down the road. So you would think 35 acres is large enough to, to house any population of insects, but in fact, it's not. And that's the problem. Biodiversity cannot be sustained in the parks and preserves that we have because they are simply too small. When you take a large habitat like this and you shrink it down to a small habitat like this, you're taking large populations and shrinking them down to small or tiny populations. And tiny populations are highly vulnerable to local extinction just through random uh, stochastic fluctuations in their population. All populations go up and they go down depending on, on external conditions. So if we look at the top line there, there's a lot of individuals in those populations. Um, and even in their down cycle, there's enough individuals so they can continue on when times get better. If we look at the bottom pink line, though, we see that when you're a tiny population and you, you fluctuate randomly, you often uh, hit zero. You blink out of your little habitat patch. And then, of course, that's the end unless you can recolonize. And because the patch is fragmented, you typically cannot recolonize. So when we conserve habitat fragments, and that's our whole mode of conservation in this country these days, we are not conserving entire ecosystems. That's, that's the bottom line here. Uh, so what's happening to all the animals that depend on all the, you know, we have measurements for plants as well, both the plants and the animals that depend on these, these habitat fragments, um, they're declining. 
If we just look at neotropical migrants, we had 127 species of neotropical migrants in steep decline in this country, which is about half of them. Does everybody recognize that bird? Bobolink? If you don't know what a bobolink is, I don't blame you because uh, they have lost 90% of their population, so you just don't see them anymore. We now have 50% fewer birds of all kinds than we had just 40 years ago. And birds are ecological indicators. If they're declining, uh, it means something's wrong with their, their ecosystems, and those are the same ecosystems that support humans. So that's why we need to, to pay attention. Should we care if we, if we lose other species? Um, most people don't, would say no, um, we don't really don't see the connection. We like nature, but if it goes away, we can always watch it on channel 12 and that'll be fine. <laughs> uh, but the answer is yes, we do need to care because it is biodiversity, it is other species that run the ecosystems that support us. It's biodiversity that equals ecosystem services. And we've already degraded 60% of the Earth's ability to create ecosystem services to support humans. Um, that's that's seriously going in the wrong direction. We need to rebuild the Earth's capacity to, to make ecosystem services. We can't be destroying it every day. So biodiversity is an essential, non-renewable natural resource, yet we are fragmenting it to extinction, at least local extinction, and that's what counts. If there's still a few members of a species in the Smoky Mountains, that's not helping us here. It's not helping your ecosystem run in your, in your yard. You need biodiversity everywhere. So fragmentation is the problem. And then building biological carters uh, is part of the solution. This is the standard model for biological carters. If you connect those isolated habitat fragments, those patches are no longer isolated, which means the populations within them are no longer tiny, which means that, that when they fluctuate normally, they're no longer subject to, to local extinction. So building these carters becomes really important. Now our standard approach to building biological carters um, I'm going to argue is not enough. Just the word carter is misleading because it implies we're only building these, these connections so that plants and animals can move back and forth to the good habitats. Uh, we've got to change that model. We want to create carters that actually facilitate life themselves, where animals can breed and live within the carter, not just in, in the habitat fragment. So they've got to support life. So I like this model a little bit better. If each one of those is a little forest patch, we're increasing the amount of, of forest patches there, and I like this even better. So the, the uh, blank areas in the middle um, could be our, our greater cities um, or, or uh, some of our farmland. But what we need to do is put the plants back that support the life um, in, in these here United States. And of course, we're going to do that in the areas where we live and we work, a lesser extent where we farm because we're, the land's already, already taken. So what do we want to build our carters out of? We want to build them out of plants, and the more plants you have, then the more, the more life you're supporting. Um, it's that simple, because plants, of course, are, are capturing the energy from the sun, converting it into food. Uh, they also, and that's what supports all the food webs that are out there, they also um, have physical structures, so they're providing shelter. So quite literally, plants are a matter of life and death for animals. If you have plants, you have the option for life and death. If you don't, you don't. But we need to talk about which plants we're going to use um, because a lot of people think all plants are equal in what they contribute to, to biological systems. And unfortunately, they are not. They do not support food webs equally. So we've got to use the right plants, the most productive plants, if we're going to succeed. And to understand that, you have to understand that plants don't want to be eaten by things. They want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they have loaded their tissues with nasty tasting chemicals secondary metabolic compounds that make these, these uh, tissues either bitter or downright toxic. Uh, it's a very effective de uh, defense that keeps most of the herbivores out there, and most of the herbivores in the world are insects from eating most of the plant material. Uh, but we do know that insects eat plants. How do they do that? Uh, they do that by specializing on particular plant lineages. They develop the adaptations, the physiological mechanisms, the behavioral adaptations, the life history adaptations that allow them to eat a particular lineage without dying. But that takes a long uh, evolutionary exposure, long period of exposure to a particular plant lineage for all these adaptations to fall into place. I'm gonna use Eastern Red Cedar as an example. I could use any plant out there as an example. Uh, but Eastern Red Cedar, uh, defends itself with a compound called beta thuyaplixin. It's a toxic monoterpene. And even though eastern red cedar has been in our, our local habitats for millions of years, interacting with our local insects for millions of years, there are still very few insects that have been able to adapt to it. So it has a very successful uh, defensive system. 
This is one that has adapted to it, though. It's the juniper hair streak, so we call it a specialist on eastern red cedar because it's developed the adaptations that allow it to eat beta thioplexin without dying. And that's the upside of specialization. The downside of specialization is that now that's all it can eat. So by developing the adaptations that, that are necessary to eat eastern red cedar, it has not developed the adaptations necessary to eat grass or lilacs or oaks or anything else. Which means if we don't have eastern red cedar in our landscapes, we don't have juniper hair streak. Uh, and that's, that's the problem with specialization these days. It's that we have rearranged our landscape so much, we have taken away the native plant communities that support all of these specialists. So specialization has become a curse for so many organisms like the monarch butterfly. That's what you're looking at there. There's only 3.6% of our monarchs left uh, in, in uh, of the migrating population of monarchs compared to 1976 because we have taken away most of the milkweeds on which they reproduce. They're specialists on Asclepius. It's the only thing they're going to reproduce on. So no milkweeds, no, no monarchs. Uh, and then we've done that largely in the Midwest, right where we are here, largely through clean farming techniques and by converting marginal land into the production of, of ethanol. We can turn this around if we want to, uh, and I hope we want to, and we've got to do it soon because this is a precipitous decline in, in monarch populations. Uh, and it's probably the most iconic insect in the world. The rest of the world's not going to be happy if we all sit here and, and watch the monarch disappear so that, so that we don't have any weeds on the side of our, of our fields. Um, so it's not just caterpillars that are specialists, uh, like the monarch. We have uh, many, well, all of the insect herbivores, or 90% of them are specialists. This is the elderberry beetle, only eats elderberry. The dogbane beetle only eats dogbane. This is the sumac flea beetle, only eats sumac. This is a Korean bug, a leaf-footed bug that only eats ash. So if the emerald ash borer kills all of our ash trees, we're going to lose this species. We're going to lose 98 specialists on ashes. And that's the problem. 90% of the insects that eat uh, plants, herbivorous insects, phytophagous insects, are specialists. They can only eat uh, one or a very few plant lineages that share the same chemical cocktail. Uh, so if we rearrange the world and bring in a whole bunch of plants that are from outside of local food webs, we're going to lose 90% of the insects that support our food webs. Uh, so we're not going to be able to build effective carters that support the effective food webs that support the rest of life if we don't use the right plants. And the specialization that, that, that really comprises most of nature always starts with plants. Why do we want all these insects in our carters? Now, I've mentioned uh, the word food web, um, and uh, it turns out that insects are critical in terms of transferring energy from plants to most other animal groups. They're really part of, of almost all terrestrial food webs. All spiders eat insects, or they eat other spiders that ate insects. Um, and if you don't like spiders, I understand that. Uh, but look who does like spiders. Spiders are the second most important component of, of uh, bird food webs, so we certainly don't want to get rid of them. Um, insect predators. We've got a tremendous diversity of insect predators out there eating the insect herbivores, and all those predators are part of food webs. Frogs eat insects, toads eat insects, all of our amphibians eat insects. Uh, freshwater fish eat insects. 60% of the protein that drives freshwater fish populations are from insects that fall into the water, terrestrial insects. So if, you're, if your streams are lined with Japanese knotweed, nothing's falling into the water because no insects have adapted to Japanese knotweed. Our lizards, our reptiles eat insects. <coughs> our bats eat insects. Our rodents eat insects because they're really good food. Pound for pound, there's twice as much protein in insect meat as there is in beef, and insects have have organs in their abdomen called fat bodies that are loaded with lipids that are high energy compounds that allow these little guys to grow and reproduce quickly. And that's the same reason that larger organisms are, are eating insects. The skunk is digging up your yard to get the, the grubs that are in your yard. Possums eat a lot of insects. And even things we don't think of as insectivores eat a lot of insects. 25% of a fox's, red fox's diet is insects. 23% uh, of a black bear's diet is insects. And even a lot of creatures that don't eat insects require insects. This is the sharp shin hawk. It's a bird predator, so it's eating other birds. And you might think you can have sharp shin hawks with no insects, but the birds it's eating needed the insects to become birds. Garter snake doesn't eat insects directly, but it eats the frogs and toads that needed the insects to become frogs and toads. So if we take insects out of our food webs, uh, those they're going to collapse, and we're particularly going to to lose. Uh, all those charismatic birds, because 96% of our birds rear their young on insects. But we can use the knowledge 
uh, that, that most insects are specialists to build effective biological carters that support effective food webs by putting the appropriate plants back into these food webs. And that's, that's why you're taking uh, bush honeysuckle out of, of all of these, these invaded habitats because bush honeysuckle supports almost no insects. Makes berries, but it doesn't support the insects these birds need when they're reproducing. And then you're replacing uh, all of those spaces with um, plants that are much better at producing insects. Huge differences in the, in the ability of plants to make insects. Um, and this is gonna work. This is, I am optimistic. I was asked last night if I was optimistic, but it's going to work because nature really is malleable. It rebounds, it's resilient, it's forgiving. Um, and because of the work that, that you're doing, um, it's going to give us uh, another chance to, to rebuild life in the United States. Thank you very much. Uh, pretty amazing information, right? And imagery, too. Um, all right, so KIB's mission, uh, which you help us undertake, is to help people and nature thrive. So you've heard the natural aspects, the ecological aspects of the work, um, and uh, now you'll hear about the impact that you're having on the people of this city uh, through the eyes of some wonderful uh, research and a wonderful researcher. Um, we have a special guest to introduce uh, this next person. So, um, Andrew, if you'd please come up. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Andy Faber. I am a research scientist in Lilly Oncology. And uh, it may seem a bit random at first as to uh, why I was uh, brought up here to introduce uh, Dr. Taylor, but actually we go back a long ways. Uh, we first met about 35 years ago. Uh, I don't recall it, but she tells me she picked me up, carried me around, and sent me down because I cried too much. But uh, <laughs> isn't that what older sisters usually say and do? <laughs> yes, I'm uh, very excited to have uh, Dr. Taylor here uh, to share her research with us. Um, uh, hopefully by the end of her talk, you'll have a new perspective on uh, how we should be interacting with our environment in a more uh, appreciative way. Uh, she received her education from the University of Illinois, a Bachelor of Science degree in Ornamental Horticulture, and a PhD in uh, Natural Resources and Environmental Sciences, with her uh, thesis research focused on ADHD and uh, poor urban populations. And this research has uh, sparked uh, numerous publications, most notably in the American Journal of Public Health, which has been cited over 300 times. Uh, it's also sparked numerous speaking engagements and interviews, uh, both nationally and internationally, including New York Times, LA Times, uh, CNN, uh, Parents Magazine, among numerous others. Um, as an avid listener of NPR, I'm a little bit in awe that she's uh, going to be a featured guest on this afternoon's uh, edition of um, Sound Medicine to talk about attention disorders, uh, so be sure to tune into that. Uh, she's currently a professor at the University of Illinois, uh, teaching courses in landscape design and novel courses such as Children in Nature. And uh, she also continues her groundbreaking research on attention disorders in green spaces. Uh, with the Landscape and Human Health Laboratory. Uh, so without further ado, I'll turn the floor over to Dr. Taylor and she can stop sweating about what I might say. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, actually I was sweating quite a bit. He sent me lots of harassing emails before this about all the things he could say and the He's, he, of the four of us kids, he's the funny one, so he was, ve he was very nice, and, um, and I really do look up to my little brother, uh, not just because he's way taller than me, uh, but because I'm so proud of him and the research that he does on cancer drugs, that's such important work, and also um, he's a really good dad to a couple of little girls who are my nieces, so um, thanks, Andy. So, as it has been mentioned, I'm here today to talk to you about the human side of things. We know quite a bit about the uh, ecological benefits of green spaces in our cities, but you might not know that there's actually research evidence that suggests we are, um, as humans, we really need these green spaces in our cities. 
I don't have a lot of time. I, I usually talk for like 45 minutes and I've got 20. So I boiled it down to the top five things you need to know about this topic. Um, and first of all, number one, humans are wired for natural environments. What does that mean? Evolutionary theory uh, is, is a theory, but it suggests, and it makes sense, it's intuitive, right? That um, if you think about it, for thousands, tens of thousands, hundred thousands of years, where did we live? We lived in very natural environments, completely immersed in nature. And uh, so, as we evolved as a species, it makes sense that we would be, our brains especially, would be very attuned to very natural settings. Where we're, you know, some, some people call it, we're hardwired for that. Uh, but we, uh, in the last couple hundred, several hundred years, we've actually moved ourselves out of very natural settings into uh, heavily built settings. And here's one statistic. In 1800, 3% of the world's population lived in cities. Today, more than half of the planet is living in urban uh, environments, and that trend is not going to reverse anytime soon. And so I think that means that if we're really not that well adapted for a heavily built environment, we need to make sure we're bringing nature into those environments. We need to inject it back into where we're living because that's, that's when we're going to do our best, when we're going to thrive. So we need to, and this is what I do in my research, consider our physical environments. There's a lot of um, emphasis on social environments and that's important too, but um, we take for granted our physical surroundings a lot of times, where, where we work, where we live, what is it like day in, day out? Is it supportive or is it just okay? You know, are we thriving or are we just limping along? Number two. Oh, I decided to renumber things. It's, it's not number one. <laughs> Moving on to number two. Uh, Urban settings and information overload fatigue us. And I think you know this, but maybe you haven't really fully appreciated what you're working against most days. Um, we live in a high uh, information society anymore. We have all this technology, which is great, except that it's constantly sending us information that we don't really need. I mean, think about, I can't stand it how everywhere I go there's a TV monitor and there's, it's telling me things, there's commercials or TV shows or, or ads or whatever, and um, it's telling me stuff I don't need to know. And so I'm expending energy tuning that out and, and filtering and deciding what, what's relevant to me and what I'm trying to do. So we, we exert a lot of energy every day working against that. And then also, as I mentioned, our urban environments are very, um, we're not necessarily adapted for those. So attentional fatigue, this is something you've all experienced you might be attentionally fatigued right now. Um, it's, uh, it's only Tuesday, right? But uh, maybe Monday was a rough day. Um, but it's, you know, we'll say, I'm fried. I'm trash. You know, I, I, I can't think you know, that mind-numbing state that you get to after filing taxes or driving in heavy traffic or taking a final exam or, you know, or just maybe your daily work is really attentionally fatiguing. You're for forcing yourself to stay on task, tune out distractions, um, go after it longer than your brain really wants to. And um, some of the symptoms include, you know, you start losing your ability to stay on task and you're unable to tune out distractions and you're irritable and you're more impulsive and you make mistakes. And you, you know what I'm talking about, right? This is, this is a very familiar state. There's an interesting theory called attention restoration theory which suggests that, um, well, they talk through, you know, attentional fatigue and what it is and, and why it's a problem and that nature is particularly good at helping us recover and restore from that state. Um, I have to move this quickly, but in a nutshell, they're saying, um, when we're in nature, it's, in, it's engaging our, uh, this other form of attention that we don't get to use very much, and that's our involuntary attention. And that's what we are using when we're watching fire or moving water, wildlife. All of these things are really easy and interesting for us to attend to, it, it doesn't, require any effort, you can watch it for a long time and not be, um, become fatigued. And the nice thing is, is when we're switched into that mode, we're not using our directed attention, which is the one we need and that we use in our daily tasks where we're really forcing ourselves to stay on task. So we're fostering uh, attention restoration, which is kind of the base for a lot of our lab's research, so it's, it's important that you understand that relationship. Attention restoration is pretty important, I mean, it helps us to uh, and stay focused and it helps with children's learning. 
some other examples are it reduces our uh, aggressiveness and our um, impulsive behavior. So we, we need to be at our best in terms of our attentional functioning. Another little side note theory that I want to throw in before I talk about some of the research is this, that um, there's a, a theory called loose parts theory that suggests that when we have a lot of loose parts in our environments, our physical environment, we're more creative. It allows us to manipulate and change our, our daily environment. And think about nature as an example, especially for children, but maybe grown-ups too. Um, how many elements there are that can be manipulated when we're in a natural setting? And um, you know, you don't usually have to teach children what to do if you just let them have that freedom. You know, they find some snails, and then well, then they start immediately thinking, how can we build a boat for the snails? And what floats in the water? And how many snails can fit before it sinks? And then you know, you have snails permanently adrift, but it's good for the kids, and they, you know, they learned a lot. They, they, lots of cause and effect and construction and trial and error and communication amongst themselves. So another example, uh, a low snow year. I think this is the world's smallest snowman. If you can tell the scale, there's an oak leaf on the head. So that's, this was not last year, uh, if you remember. But uh, again, natural materials fostering creativity, thinking about changing the scale down to a really small snowman and switching to seeds instead of rocks. Number three, or one, we're <laughs> going backwards. Green spaces and the arrow disappeared too. This is exciting. It's all, it's all random. Green spaces are um, related to healthy functioning children. That's what that's telling you. So this is of the top five things you need to know. I'm going to run through a real quick list of some of the relationships and findings that our lab and other people's research has uh, shown. And I'm just going to say one time that everything I'm presenting is statistically significant and builds off of theory. And I mentioned some of those theories. For example, in Chicago, in uh, Robert Taylor Homes, it's a heavily impoverished um, public housing development that um, fortunately has been torn down because it was, it was a very difficult living uh, conditions. There were situations like this where some of the courtyards, like you see on the left, were barren. They had had trees initially, and then over time the trees died, they got cut down, and the space got paved over. So some people living there had uh, a barren courtyard, and other people had some trees or a lot of trees in their courtyard. So you have kind of this range of greenness, and we, we measured that and looked at how people were functioning living in those apartments adjacent to those spaces. And um, sadly, almost all the other variables that might affect a person's functioning were pretty much um, uniform across the development. I mean, the buildings were all architecturally identical. Um, life circumstances were nearly identical for all of the, uh, the residents and the children. So uh, the only thing that really varied in their life was um, the, the view outside their apartment or um, this space right outside their building. One of the things that we found was for um, Girls, a green view, well, a number, of, but girls and adults, a green view makes a measurable difference in functioning. For example, we found um, using standard psychological measures of self-discipline, uh, which self-discipline is pretty important, right? And we can make it more, uh, make it further in the world if we have good uh, capacity for self-discipline. The greener the view, the higher the girls scored on that measure. And um, it was a very nice positive slope they also scored um, consistently higher on measures of concentration, uh, measures of capacity for impulse control, and um, the, uh, their capacity to delay gratification. And just an example, you know, if you're living in poverty and you have a greater capacity to delay gratification, that's really important for getting out of poverty. You know, focusing on college instead of just you know trying to get through the day or thinking long term. That's that's really um, what we want. And so um, we just found that really striking, that just a few trees made a measurable difference in, in the way that the girls were functioning. In another um, public housing development, we again see uh, the extreme ends of the scale, barren and a little bit greener. And it's not really lush or wonderful, is it? I mean, it's just a few trees, literally. But um, when we measure the activities going on in those courtyards, in the ones that have you know, what we called high green spaces, we saw significantly more play, twice as much play occurring with the children, significantly more creative forms of play. Creative forms of play are really important uh, for healthy development. 
want creative kids. Um, and no differences in other activities. So it wasn't like they were just all hanging out in the green spaces because they were more comfortable. They were actually relatively evenly distributed throughout the development, but when they were in a green space, they were more likely to be engaged in play instead of just loitering or, and more likely to be engaged in creative play. And they had more accessible adults. And given how um, dangerous that neighborhood was and how high the crime rate was, to have accessible adults is really critical. And, um, Creative play, as I mentioned, is really important for healthy development, and even popular press is starting to pick up on this, and they're claiming there's a crisis in America that we've, as a society, declined in our creativity, and so thinking about ways to foster creativity and, and encourage children to be um, more creative is important. Another population that we looked at was uh, children with ADHD. And, um, you're probably familiar with that, but it's a neuro neurobiological disorder. Uh, children with ADHD really struggle with being able to pay attention, and control impulses, and some of them have hyperactivity as well. And it affects a lot of kids in the United States. It's a serious issue, a lot of people asking questions, what can we do, how can we help kids with ADHD? And in our work, you know, we realize nature is not going to cure children from uh, this disorder but they need additional ways to manage their symptoms. And because nature has been shown with a number of studies now that it supports attention in adults and um, also just general population children, we felt like, well, maybe children with ADHD also benefit in some way. Does it help minimize their symptoms temporarily or, or help them control their symptoms a little? We did a number of studies, too, where um, the first study was limited to the Midwest with 96 children, and then the second was um, we replicated that study nationwide with 452. And in both studies, we found the same relationship, but you can't see on the, I see the arrow is gone. But <clears throat> one of the things we found was when we asked about where does your child typically play after school on the weekends, what does it look like, and there were a number of categories that parents could choose from. The um, kids who typically played in a greener category of setting also had lower severity of symptoms overall. Their case of ADHD was uh, milder. And that those studies we also asked about activities. And when your child does this activity in this setting, what are their symptoms like immediately afterwards? Same as usual, you know, worse, much worse, much better, these kinds of ratings. And um, there was a pattern, again, where kids who, when they did activities in greener uh, settings versus indoor or an outdoor setting that's very built, their symptoms were um, less severe, measurably less severe, immediately after the activity. So greener settings do seem to be helpful, at least for a little while, in uh, lessening symptoms. And in that larger study, because we had a big sample, we could start controlling for other variables and checking to see if it was, uh, the relationship was influenced by these. And um, the relationship holds. It's true for kids who live in rural settings, inner city settings, all ages, girls and boys. Um, the, regardless of how severe their case of ADHD. So that was interesting and helpful. It appears to be a generalizable relationship. And so on, on one more study that we did related to that was, um, you know, those were correlational studies. We're trying to get a little closer to causality and trying to control more of the variables. So um, we took children on forced marches. <laughs> we, we didn't tell them it was that. We, we said, we're going for a walk, and you can't talk, and you have to walk with your walking guide, and you have to stay on the path, and it's for exactly 20 minutes, and all of these things. We walked them through uh, three different settings on three different, one of three settings on different occasions, trying to control many of the variables, and then compared the child's scores with themselves on the, in the three settings. And on average, most kids scored significantly higher on a standard uh, measure of concentration. Uh, after the park walk than they did after the neighborhood or downtown walks. So that was encouraging and again reinforces this idea that maybe spending time in green spaces is helpful at um, lessening symptoms at least for a little while. And then of course there are the things that the parents say which are really powerful and they're only anecdotal but um, I, I conducted a number of focus groups and they would say things spontaneously like, oh my son can fish for hours and afterwards his symptoms are hardly noticeable. And that's, that was huge for them. I mean, if families who are struggling with ADHD symptoms, if they can find some activity or something that's healthy and that um, helps reduce those symptoms for a while, that's good. Other people have been looking at children and nature and, and trying to determine if there are benefits and found things like um, 
links between residential nature and attentional functioning, residential nature and being able to cope with stress, lower obesity rates. Um, that one was done locally, IUPUI, um, by Lou and Val. Uh, nature has been linked with lower asthma rates. Schoolyard nature has been linked with better outcomes in high schools. That was an interesting study done in Michigan. Uh, okay, enough about children. Number four, or one, of the top five things you need to know are is that um, not only is nature good for kids, it's good for us as adults. We're in better shape, we're higher functioning and healthier. For example, some of the research in Chicago Public Housing that our lab conducted uh, found that when adults had a, a greener courtyard in those uh, in intensely impoverished areas, they scored higher on measures of cognitive functioning, they were better able to manage life um, issues. They had lower rates of aggressive behavior and violent behavior, and those are based on either self-report or police report. Socially, they were better off. Uh, greener courtyards, uh, residents with greener courtyards also had greater strength of community. They knew their neighbors. They participated more in working together, which is really important. Um, when you're in poverty, you have to share resources and work together. Uh, those spaces had lower rates of graffiti, noise, litter, loitering and illegal activity. I mean, more eyes on the street, more people out taking in ownership of those spaces helped. Um, property crimes and violent crimes were significantly lower based on police reports in those spaces. So um, it, greening makes a difference. It really does. It is measurable. Other people have been also uh, looking at nature's benefits, and there's a lot, just in the last 20 years, a growing body of evidence. Uh, I only have a very small sample here, but um, Interesting things, physiological measures such as um, nature exposure being uh, related to uh, lowering our stress levels, lowering our blood glucose levels, uh, lower rates of anxiety disorders and mortality rates. And those are, some of those studies are international. This isn't just limited to North America. Um, oh, I want to point out one thing. So if you want to read a lot more about that, there's a great review article out there and it's um, accessible on the, um, National Recreation and Parks Association website. You can download the PDF. Okay, number five, or number one, of the top five things you need to know is that KIB and Lily's urban greening efforts make it easier for us to put ourselves in restorative environments or supportive environments, and, and um, that's a good thing. Um, I feel that the evidence really suggests that uh, trees and green space do support healthy functioning in children and in adults, and it helps that, you know, if we're doing well day in and day out, like being able to pay attention, that's pretty important, pretty fundamental. Um, you're gonna learn more in school, you're going to do better at work, and that has long-term ramifications, developing into healthy uh, adults and um, success in life. So I think trees and green space, you know, are, they're often viewed as accessories or niceties, they're pretty, and. Well, sure, if there's money left over, let's plant some trees at the new school, but they're actually, uh, I think the research is showing it's a necessity. We, as humans, we need green spaces, we need them daily, they've got to be woven into our, uh, our daily lives and so, um, and for our best functioning. As you saw in the urban public housing, um, interestingly, just a few trees made a huge, a measurable difference. Uh, it's, it, I still, I still that bother, uh, it boggles my mind a little bit that you know it wasn't that nice, but it was something, and something is definitely better than nothing. So everything you do, every tree you plant makes a difference. We all need to get out to nature more, but we're too busy. We've got a lot to do at work, and we've got a lot going on. But KIB's work is really making that easier for you, and um, that's a wonderful thing. Intensely urban areas, we need green space. We need, uh, I think the research shows we need it frequently. It's not enough to do two weeks in Colorado once a year and like there, I did my nature thing and I'm, I'm good to go. <laughs> we, we need to restore every day. We fatigue every day, we need to bring that back every day. So we need a variety of forms of green spaces. They've gotta be easy to access and woven into our, just our daily commute, our down times, our lunch times, our after work <laughs> hours. So your green spaces are supporting recovery from overstimulation and fatigue. They're fostering uh, community and reducing antisocial behaviors. There's that summary of research if you want to look that up. We are also providing on our website, our lab's website, uh, these flyers are kind of like nuggetized forms of the research if you, if you just want a quick summary. 
I'll point out that all of the work I led with children, uh, Ming Kuo was involved in all of those studies, William Sullivan and Angela Wiley were involved in some of those studies, and we're so grateful to our um, funders and our supporters like Forest Service. So, we can't fix all the stressors that families have to endure. I mean, life is tough and it seems like it's only getting worse, but we can make it easier for families to put themselves in supportive environments. So thank you for the work that you do. Please be encouraged and continue to do that. Every little bit literally makes a difference.